introduction and uh, the nice comments about my wife's music. Um, that is one of her favorite things, and uh, I didn't want to bring it up, but since you did, you know, it's on all the stores, um, the streaming stores, Ashley Cook, and she has two albums, and she just loves to inspire people with beautiful music. So, um, my story, I'm happy to be here. Um, excited always to be with you guys. Like, it literally is something I really look forward to. I think it's a lot of fun to interact with the students and get their energy and um, hopefully inspire the energy. Um, done this a few times and I've always thoroughly enjoyed it. So feel free to like have, ask questions during. I know there's Q&A after, but if something's burning hot and you want to ask sooner, go for it. Um, and uh, just glad to be here. Um, to get to know you guys uh, for one second a little bit, how many of you are running a business or have decided to run a business you're going to Graduate and then run a business. That's your plan. A couple of you, okay. Already kind of determined. And how many of you are here in the class because um, you're wondering if you want to do this? All right, a few more. Cool. It's all good. You know, to, entrepreneurism is definitely not for everyone. Um, it's definitely a huge challenge. It's huge excitement. Um, I hang around with lots and lots of entrepreneurs. And um, every, although everyone doesn't kind of fit the same mold, that's not possible, but generally speaking, entrepreneurs tend to be a little bit more down the spectrum in terms of adventure and risk taking and, and some of these things. Because it's kind of crazy, you know? You kind of have to get out there and get a little crazy. So um, it's, to me, that's fun. To not everyone, like to my accountant, for example, nothing against accountants, but um, to my accountant, the things I do as an entrepreneur are not exciting. You know, he's always trying to shut me down. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> We're going to figure out a way to do that. So I wanted to tell you um, some tales from the trenches. Um, I've started a couple, quite a couple of companies. I've purchased companies. I've made a whole bunch of investments in companies. Um, so I've got, you know, a, de a couple decades of experience doing this. And um, I just wanted to be real with you guys. Because um, I've got, I know some people when I talk, yeah. Just a question before you go into yes. details of the trenches. Um, how many entrepreneurs do you know start like right out of college, started a business, or were in like the corporate world and then shifted over to be an entrepreneur? Uh, more and more, they're starting right out of college because yeah. we got great programs. Like when I went through, they didn't even have such a thing, entrepreneurism. I had, I just winged it, and I didn't even do it right out of college, but very purposefully didn't. I'm going to tell you that story, but it's not a bad idea. Personally, my opinion is, is that you could do better by getting some industry experience if the thing you want to go into lends well for that. Uh, but if you're creating something new and there's really no one to talk to and there's no industry experience to be had, if that's a thing, um, I would debate that. But um, it's not a bad idea. Just uh, get mentors. You know, be smart. So we're going to talk about all that. Good question. Thank you. Um, so. I've had friends over the years, or people that I know, who just love to tell you all the successes. You know, they want to be all that, and they are all that. They're cool guys, but not not everyone's so excited to tell you about their flops, their failures, their bad investments. I'll tell you about a few of those because it's good to be real. You know, this stuff happens, and um, most entrepreneurs you see, they're all up in the lights, they're up on the stage, they're doing huge things. What you don't see is the reason why they're there doing that is because they've had horrific failures. So as you go along the path of, of business entrepreneurship and you experience like near-death experiences, horrific failures, total depression about what you're doing, just realize you're normal. Like this is happening. You're in it. <laughs> so stick with it. Um, first, I'm going to tell you kind of the trajectory of the main company. Sorry, this slide's a little dark. This is Solution Stream. This is kind of like the thing that got it all started, and this kind of is fueled all the fun since. So, mad props to Solution Stream and the company that uh, me and uh, Jason founded um, 20 years ago. Um, I'll give you a few minutes on the story of that because it's been a crazy fun ride. So, um, I was going through college like you. Um, I was a nerd kind of to start with. I always liked tech and programming. Um, I was learning how to do that on the side because it was just so fun. Um, unless I paint myself as like total nerd. I wasn't ever as nerdy or 
thought I was as nerdy, like to go into the CS program, computer science, but close. <laughs> um, so I was in business. I actually came here to middle school, got my degree here, and I was in information systems because that's what they had for technology guys. And um, along the way, I was programming, and I learned that uh, I could program for some clients. I made some connections with people who needed databases built or different little simple things. And um, I was making pretty good money at that. I thought, this is pretty cool. So uh, instead of making seven bucks an hour in the, in the computer lab, which I also was working that job, I could make 30 or 40 bucks an hour doing custom programming. I'm just like, this rocks, because I would do this for free. That's how much fun. I would literally go home and program stuff on my own for fun, for free, because I loved it so much. And um, clients are going to pay me for a minute? I mean, this seems wrong. <laughs> so. I was putting myself through school doing that. I went to uh, the U to get my MBA just to mix things up a little bit. Um, got my MBA there and a couple things really stuck with me there. Um, one is I had a mentor uh, who said a couple things in his class. He was a, a legit entrepreneur, like the crazy type. And he said some things that just like burned into my mind that actually became a huge part of my mantra and my kind of my success. One of the things that he was running this, this um, well, it's an old school thing. This is like before internet, guys. I'm, okay, I'm that old. I saw the internet get born, okay? I was there when it happened. <laughs> That's how old I am. But um, so before internet, if you can imagine such a thing, they would send faxes out of like stuff to buy. And this guy had this huge fax farm with thousands of fax machines and would just fax all these stores. People would pick these up and they could figure out what to buy, call a phone number and buy it. What's a it was fax? Amazon before internet. <laughs> What's a fax? <laughs> yeah, what is a fax? Should you start there? Yeah. You guys know what a fax is, right? You put a piece of paper in a machine and it dials. Well, okay, okay. Okay. So, um, this was his business, but he said to me, like, what if his, his MO was he had set up his whole business? He's like, my goal is like, I've got this smoothly run operation like, that can be making me money while I sleep. That was literally like his thing. Like, I want to make money while I'm asleep. And that just stuck with me. Just like, whoa. Because I'd only been programming to make money. You go on the clock, you go off the clock. I'm, thought, I'm thinking, how do you do that? You're asleep or you're on the beach and you're making money. You can do this? Who writes these rules? So that was one thing. I was then programming, still doing my thing. And I was about to leave. And to your point, I was going to start my company. I actually wrote as my... Final project, the business plan for Solution Stream. Software development company, mobile apps back in the day, um, client server apps, web apps, hire contractors, deliver software. And um, he said, this mentor said, you should go work in the industry. I know you don't want to, and I don't, you probably don't need to, but go work for these companies, sit across the table, buy the services, see what's wrong, dial it in better, you'll be glad you did. And I did. I very purposefully went to a couple different companies, jumped around a little bit to learn what I needed to learn. And even though I got my glorious MBA, which is like, you know, MBAs, huge stuff, right? I had that. But I took like a real pee on job. <laughs> I was actually really embarrassed to tell my friends like what job title I had and what my salary was, because that's always the talk, like comparing notes. Because it was totally bottom rung, guys. I was embarrassed, but I knew I needed to know this. <laughs> so I literally went to that job just to learn what they had to teach me. And then I got promoted, and then I got more. But at some point in there, you know, it just was making me crazy. So I had to j jump, change companies, and this went on for a couple of years. But my, my tra trajectory was, I'm going to start my own company. And um, those two things that he said to me, those really were really valuable. So um, at some point, the pain level of like being an employee for me was just like, I realized I am not cut out for this. I can't be an employee anymore. Um, I was making ridiculous asks of my company um, and I was, they were getting frustrated with me. So basically, I went into my boss. This was a, a, a small cable company. They had like, they were doing tons of money and manufacturing in China, huge stuff. Um, but it was, a, it was a small company in terms of employees. I basically said, all right, Dan, sorry to do this to you, but I either need to become your partner or you need to become my client because I'm done. 
you know, and a little more tactfully, but probably not a lot more tactfully than that. <laughs> and he became a client, first client, bam, was my employer. And then Jason did the same thing. He went, I told him the story, he's like, are you kidding me, you quit your job, what are you doing, you're crazy. I'm like, you gotta do the same thing right now. And uh, so he did the same thing, walks in, they offered him like double salary, VP, and he almost didn't quit. But he called me back, and I said, you gotta quit, dude. I already quit, you're gonna quit. Let's do this. <laughs> so he did, he quit. We both all of a sudden look at each other the next day like, ah, <laughs> scared to death. But that first year, more than doubled what I made previous year. Just because I'm writing my own checks now. I, you know, unleashed potential, right? Next year, doubled it again. Next year, doubled it again. And we're just like, boom. So it was good timing too, good industry to be in, software development, back when no one was doing it. Um, so we had a good stiff wind, you know, powering forward. Um, so Solution Stream has just over the years cranked. Like we've become, you know, one of the major development shops in the area. We service Western United States. Um, number of employees kind of changes sometimes, but about 100 people. Um, we build complicated software, web, mobile, enterprise systems. Um, in fact, um, the guy who was here a few months ago, I think, maybe in the last year, uh, Bali Metrics, you guys know them? We built their, their initial software. This is an example like of a startup that we built software for, or we built huge systems for Western Governors University. It's a totally online university. So that's just an awesome company, you know? People love to work there because they get challenged. Um, we love to be the bosses and own it because it's hard and it's fun and um, that has just like, that was the platform. So we got that thing operating really healthy, super profitable and just really tuned in. Um, that enabled me to get adventuresome again. So, um, oh here's an example of, these are some of the clients we've worked on over the years. We've done thousands of projects. Um, over the years, we've had thousands of employees. It's just, just incredible the kind of experiences you can have just with the simplest idea of like, I'm gonna start my own company. Who knew? I never knew when I, it was just me and Jason that we'd have hundreds of employees or over the course of years, thousands of employees or the, the, they could be so incredible or so difficult. But it's really awesome. So something else I got into, I'm gonna be a little real for some failures too, is you get a little bit of money, you get a little confidence, and you make some investments because you know you're like all that. You you everything you touch turns to gold, right? Wrong. Because <laughs> if you get into an industry um, like sports nutrition that you don't know how to do it, um, you're exposing yourself to more risk than you know. But we thought we were doing it smart because we had a really smart guy with us who knew all this stuff, and we knew how to do the tech of it because we we're going to do online delivery and he had all the manufacturing and the product and the messaging all figured out, but, but no. I mean, we tried for like a year, year and a half, spent more than a million dollars on this one, and we learned hard lessons. Um, so, just because you've done it before once, especially doesn't mean you can do it again, right? And especially if you compound the risk on top, you're doing it in a new category, like an industry you don't know, you're working with new people who you don't know. You're just like layering risk on there. So we ended up uh, basically losing all our money on that deal. And it was really painful. And um, thousands of hours of trying to figure out what to do and writing more checks and just trying to solve the problem until at some point you just have to kill it. But um, yeah. What, what was it about that that failed? So what failed was, um, our lack of knowledge of that industry. The guy we were working with on it was a super ambitious CEO, entrepreneur himself, highly respected, and a good friend of mine today. But um, he was out of his depth. But we trusted him because we thought he knew more about that market than we did. And um, we just, it's just, a, you know, trying to get, at that, at that stage, I would also say that the sports nutrition thing was becoming commoditized. Like earlier on, protein powders and formulations and things were kind of a new thing and you were getting margin for it. But like right at the time, 
we were trying to launch this, all the margins were getting crushed, Amazon was coming online, other big websites delivering this stuff for pennies. So there's no operating uh, margin profit anyway. So a couple hard lessons right there. Um, but never fear, always the entrepreneur. I went on to another one because I'm sitting there solution stream, things are running, clicking real nice, and I'm seeing an opportunity at my own company going, you know what? One thing we can't solve as a company, this is a domain I know, is how to staff projects more efficiently. We're going to build software to staff projects efficiently. And this was a domain I know cold, because this is 20 years of experience talking now. And by the way, it's web delivered, so we know how to develop software. I figured, you know what? This one's a lot better opportunity. But no, this one didn't go either. Um, I will caveat, we do use this software still. Um, it's a good internal tool, but our market launch uh, never took off. And um, what this does, it's actually really awesome software. The thing, this is what made me the craziest about it. I interviewed kind of a cool opportunity, actually, that I created. Um, when can you ever, as an entrepreneur, go interview and ask really personal details of all of your competitors? They don't, competitors don't like you. So will they pick up the phone? Maybe, maybe not. Will they talk to you or dish like really good information about their own company? No. But when you build a tool that they need and you're coming at it from this other angle and they're like really tantalized, they will. So I got to actually interview hundreds of my competitors about how they were solving this problem internally. And just that knowledge alone was just like made the whole thing worth it. To sit down there and like have an open book. How many employees do you have? What's your efficiency? What's your profit for employee? Boom, 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 boom. You're just getting all these numbers out of, to, so because they want to use the software, which is going to solve all their efficiency and profitability problems. Um, so I thought that was really awesome. The problem was um, that we didn't have market fit. We never raised money on it. We were self-funded. And um, I honestly think if we had another, you know, 500,000 bucks on this one, we we could have got it launched. We were close. But um, between partner conflicts about how much money they wanted to put into it, difficult market fit, and a couple other things, this one, we just kind of had to like put it as an internal software tool at Solution Stream and kind of lick our wounds. So to be honest with you, there's a couple like that in your history. Yeah? What do you mean difficult market fit? What do you mean by market fit? Um, we had not dialed in uh, who our customers were and like what the messaging was to like really get them to close. So actually that reminded me of a point. Like when I interviewed all these hundreds of competitors, I like n almost all of them resonated with the pain and almost all of them said they would buy. Like it was like shocking. And these were not my, all my friends, you know, cause you, you initially get that when you put a new thing out there and you're talking to people who know you and they want to give you, you know, nice answers. But when you go to your competitors, and they're telling you they like it and they need it and they want it. You're like, success, this is it. But actually getting them to get in the software, write us checks, you know, the final stages of the funnel, so to speak, we just didn't get enough traction. So it's because we didn't really, hadn't dialed in exactly what our customers needed yet. Um, I don't know if that answers your yeah. question though. So that was a, a difficult one. Learned a ton of stuff. But see, here's the thing. Um, the pleasure is enticing, but pain instructs, okay? Like, the pleasure of making money or having successes or doing all the things you can do with money when you make it big on something, it's awesome, but it's so distracting. Like, you can't ever forget that those are not the, those are not the lessons that are going to go with you. The, the lessons that are going to go with you is when you get your teeth kicked in. It's when you lose a million dollars. It's when you are staring in the mirror going, I, I stink at this. <laughs> that's, when you, that's when you start learning, okay? <laughs> so these, these kinds of hard lessons actually have been the fuel to like additional success. Later on, I bought another company, mobile app, productivity app. Um, this is a current company that I currently own. I've got 10 people on this team, all remote, um, except for one. And um, we have a pretty cool productivity app. It's a to-do list. You can share tasks. You can 
make grocery lists, you can plan projects, set yourself due dates, reminders. It's like if you know, uh, you know what the tip, what the Google and the Apple reminders does, it's like ten times more powerful than that for power users. So I bought this company and have operated it for the last couple of years, and it's okay. I will, I'll be honest, this, we haven't had like breakout success, but it's very profitable. You know, it's very level. Um, so in terms of financial, it's good. It's not my best investment ever, but it's definitely not a fail. Like we can do this. Um, frustrating thing is we just haven't found this like breakout energy yet, which I constantly struggle with. But you know, it's just it's all just fun. Like this is my thing. Some people just want to start one company and just take that thing. Twenty years, one thing. I'm more distracted than that. I got ADD or something, but I'm always doing a bunch of things. And I like the idea that this company is quote unquote running itself, even though it never is. But you can you can bring other people in who take the burden, and they're running it, and you got a cash flow, or you got you got potential value that's coming back to you. And you get a whole bunch of these going, and that sets up a pretty, pretty nice system. Pretty good success for you. So that's half a go. All right, so lessons learned. This is kind of, I'll tell some more stories in here as well, but these are, these are kind of some of my big takeaways. Yes, questions? Manage your time when you're running two or three or four companies all at the same time. You gotta be efficient. You gotta have a to-do list. Boom! I saw that coming, right? <laughs> you gotta own a company that does to-do lists. That's how obsessed you can get with it. Um, no, but seriously, being that organized is super helpful. Having a good personal system. Um, I have, in the, in the past five years, for me it's been a leveling up. I wouldn't have done this early on, but in the last five years I've I have an, an admin that I hired who takes care of a ton of stuff for me. Like, I like to think of it as it's me to the squared. You know what I mean? Because like, I can focus on the things I can do and drive growth, revenue, talk to employees, strategy, and my assistant and my team. It's like I have all these individual companies, and there's four, but my own system is kind of like its own company. You know what I mean? Like, I've optimized that so that I can manage everything I got going on. And it's to me, it's thrilling. Maybe to other people would be like, that's too much. I've had people tell me, you got too much going on, man. Like, like critically. You're too distracted. You can't be good at all things. And I've heard those voices. I'm just like, I've tried to do one thing, and I'm not good at doing one thing. Like, what I'm good at is doing a lot of things. So that's what I'm doing. <laughs> My best at it, anyway. Yeah. So when it comes to buying a business, could you share the process from when you first know the business and then finally when you make the deal of the business? Yeah, um, that's probably like a whole topic. I can give you like one or two comments about it, if that's okay. It's probably like a whole other topic to go into. But um, in this case, I was on the market. I kind of knew what I wanted to look for, so I was networking like crazy with people that I knew who were frustrated as partners or they had been at it for a long time, and they were motivated. You know what I mean? Um, but I also, one of my criteria was I wanted something that had cash flow. I didn't want to buy a problem. I didn't want to buy something that I had to put in millions of dollars into to see if it would go. I wanted something going. So once I had my criteria, I just started like networking and meeting lots of people. I found two founders who were in that exact situation. They'd done it for 10 years. They were frustrated with each other and the business and um, just started talking about it. Made them an offer and owned the company. Yeah. Better. Yeah, so anyway. Um, so number one is like, you gotta, you're kind of like the average of the, the, the people that you associate with. Um, and you know, recognize friends are friends that you are socializing with. That's not what I'm talking about. Because uh, just make sure the friends you're hanging out with are they're making you a better person, for sure that. But in a professional sense, you've got to like be focused and driven about associating and hanging out with people who are where you want to be. Like on LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn like crazy. I have lots of followers. Like Trump says, so many friends. Um, <laughs> but have you seen that video clip? 
I have so many friends, look it up. Oh my gosh, you won't stop laughing for a day. But um, on LinkedIn, there's all these influencers out there. That's like this thing, like being an influencer. They're all that. I'm just like looking at the influencers. What they're good at is like getting lots of followers, but have they, are they it? Have they done it? Like, is that influencer or those people who you think are so awesome where you want to be? Or are they just peers? Like, I purposefully look for groups that would force me to level up. They are so far beyond where I am right now, either intellectually, financially, drive, experience of, you know, industries or investing. So purposefully got into a number of groups like that where I was totally like, Ooh, I'm not even sure I belong in here with these people. They are so far beyond me. But you just start associating and providing value there, and you're picking up like what they know. So like one of my one of my things that I did in the last years was I found an investment group of like people who were, whose net worth was way more than mine, and I said to myself because I, I always said to myself. How do really wealthy, really smart people do this? That's what I got to know. So I created slash found a group of these guys, and I just sucked it up. You know, that was a huge level up for me, personally. But there's all kinds of ways to level up, whether it's professional, whether it's knowledge about domain or industry expertise. You know, I give an investment example. Just think about those groups. How are you going to get into the group that has the people who are 10 times beyond where you want to be? That's where you need to hang out. They'll, because you'll just pick it up. Yuri, yeah. Um, this has something to do with the surrounding yourself, like who you surround yourself with. So like in the tech industry, do you surround yourself with people that, like, like how many people do you surround yourself that aren't? Don't have a background in tech. Like I'm a, I study finance, but I'm really interested in the tech industry. But yeah. realistically, how many finance people are in startups in the tech industry if they don't really know anything about it? Does that make sense? Um, yeah, I think I understand your question. But like, I mean, so if, if you're interested in tech finance, so to speak, so then yeah. CFOs, like who run startups, mm -hmm. they're like in the thick of it. Like they know everything there is to know about raising money or about cap, cap, cap tables or, you know, startup financing, those, yeah. that'd be a group to, to hang out with. Okay. How to get to know them. Like, where do they hang out? What associations do they belong to? And like, literally pay serious money to get in those groups, okay? You're making an investment in yourself. And if something, like go to a conference to meet someone costs a couple thousand dollars, do it. Like, if that's how you level up and you meet someone, that person might make a million dollar difference to your net worth bottom line if you can meet them and connect with them. Like anytime you can invest in your smell, self and it's a smart investment, take that investment every time. Okay, good question. Um, next thing is like to find your fuel, you know? Like I see so many people who just like, they, and I, I'm not saying like I never was in this situation because I was, but I've found personally just a way to like tap into my motivational energy. Like what gets me up, what gets me excited, what keeps me going, what makes the difference between I'm bored, I'm in a blah job, I don't like what I'm doing, I'm no good at this versus like full steam, pedal to the metal, I'm firing all cylinders. Is that enough like uh, metaphor for you? <laughs> so, but seriously, like your rocket fuel is what? Like what would you do for free? that is so fun. That's a good starting place. Like something that is so fascinating to you, if someone would give you a job on that, you wouldn't even take money if you didn't have to. That's kind of triangulating where your energy is. And that's just important because I, I'm convinced that to like be the best at whatever you're going to do, and I don't care if you're an entrepreneur, employee of a company or whatever, that's, the, that's what you got to tap into. And if you don't have that energy and you can't find it, keep searching for it. Like think of like what, I always like to think of the blank check metaphor. Like, okay, what's my perfect dream job? Hmm, let's see. I gotta do lots of things. Um, I'm not tied to a desk. Uh, nobody owns me. You know, I can go down this list of things and then I just like, it seems like fantasy, 
but you're actually just planting these seeds. You're like fantasizing about this perfect dream. But guess what? That fantasy from 20 years ago, like my, honestly, my life is better than the fantasy I thought of. It's like way better. So if you plant those seeds and you go for it and you're making good choices and doing these things, you're going to end up probably better than what you planned. But it has to do with it. Your, your fuel, your energy. If you're bored at a job, quit that job. Don't waste time. Don't worry about loyalty. Get into something that makes you click. Okay? It gets you up every day and you're excited to do it. And if you don't have that thing, keep looking for it. Talk to people. I was just talking with um, a, a friend of mine. My, my son is here at BYU. So his friend last night gave him a little mentoring session because he was struggling with this idea. I don't know where my energy is. I don't, I don't know what to do. He's very capable, lots of potential, lots of different places he can go. And I challenged him to go have 50 conversations like we just had last night. I'm like, pick four or five different industries you're interested in. Pick four or five roles like CEO, VP of product, finance, sales, like whatever role you think. And like, I said, build a matrix and fill that thing in. Make it be 50 visits in the next few months. And I guarantee you, if you go talk to all those people, stuff's going to start clicking. Stuff's going to fire for you. So he's going to do that. And I'm, I started him off with three or four introductions. I just said, simple thing is, is every single person I introduce you to, get three intros from them. And you'll be at 50 before you know it. All right. Um, so set goals and dream big. One thing that... Um, I always made a habit, and this is kind of back to the motivational energy thing, is my business partner taught me this, is we would play these little mind games. But they're just super tangible. Like at one point with Solution Stream, early, early, early on, we were like making X amount per month. And we knew we could bank on that, because the company was just doing that amount. And we'd sit there and like fantasize, like, what if, what if we could make, you know, what if we went from this amount to that amount, we set a goal. Like, that would be so cool. What if we could draw this much? And um, that was like our, that was the goal we were working for. And invariably, within a few months, because we're you know trying to do our best and really applying in a good market, we'd exceed that goal. And then we'd set another goal, and then we exceeded it. And we just kept doing that. Um, it wasn't totally linear. There were lots of ups and downs, of course. But um, every time we'd set one of these goals, we would just blow it out. And I just thought to myself, you know, over the years, like, why didn't I set bigger goals on that? Like, why did I think so small? That was my problem. I was setting goals that were actually limiting me, or what I actually might have been able to do. Um, so set, set goals for yourself. Also, be accountable to yourself. That's part of this. Like, every single week, I have, a, I have like a half an hour meeting with me, and in a half an hour, I sit down and I say, I look, I have my long-term objectives, they're right there in Evernote. This is what I'm doing this year. This is what I'm about. And every single week I sit down and I go, okay, what am I doing every week to advance towards these main objectives that I have? And I hold myself accountable. And if you can't do that, or maybe you haven't learned, you know, maybe the discipline, or maybe you're not good at holding yourself accountable, get someone to do it for you. They don't even need to know about your stuff, but you can just say, look, I need you to hold me accountable. Every week I'm going to tell you what my goals are, and every week I'm going to check in with you, and you're going to ask me, how am I doing all these? Because, I mean, realistically, you're going to be embarrassed if week after week you just tell them, I got distracted, or I didn't do that, or I changed my mind. It's going to get old. But that's the self-accountability that you need. Like, if you want to go places, set these big goals, make the plan, and then hold yourself accountable to that thing. Um, one, one other funny story that was just kind of a stupid goal, but, you know, this, you kind of have to figure out, like, what motivates you. For me and Jason, like, I had only had dumpy cars ever. Like, total trash, beaters. And um, it just enthralled me, the idea that not only could I go buy a brand new car, but I would do it with cash. Like that was going to be a big deal. And I'm looking back, I actually own a dealership now, and I just look back and I go, ah, oh, it was such a stupid waste of money. But actually it wasn't, because the, the mental motivation of like, I'm going to buy a car for cash, like strut into that dealership, you know, 
write that check out, choo, 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 slam, I don't need a loan, boo! <laughs> That's what we did. And it took us a little bit of time to get there, but I went and bought a brand new Tahoe for $63,000. And I wrote that check out and I'm like, oh, this is so fun. I got to do this again. <laughs> Not with another car, because I was wasting a lot of money. But um, I got much smarter on the car thing, but that's a different topic. Um, but just goals like that. Like set yourself a goal that like, really motivates you and like, you're, you're going to be insanely motivated to get this thing and then tie your goals to that thing. And just hang it out there and be like, uh, I have a friend who, he's a multi-millionaire. He could have walked in and bought any car from any dealership, but he refused to let himself buy the prized Corvette. It was this special model. I don't even know Corvettes because I don't do American cars. I like other European cars. But this guy, he said, until I reach this sales goal, I'm not buying that car for myself. And he could have bought the dealership, literally. But he wanted that car because it was like a childhood symbol. And he forced himself to like get to this sales goal and then he bought that car. It's a sweet car. All right, so um, know yourself. That sounds kind of corny, but early on, you're young. I was young, I was your age when I started all this and I didn't know that I didn't know myself. And if you don't know yourself, it's really hard to pick good partners and really hard to like uh, not have like personality or partnership issues slowing you down. So what I'm saying is, is like be really aware of yourself and like learn what you're good at and what you're not good at, and be be okay with it. You're not good at everything. You can't be. So if you're part, if you're looking for a partner to help run a business, like really know what you like to do and make sure that. Um, even if it's like the coolest person in the world, or you've been best friends forever, I'm not even saying that's a bad idea, but it's a better idea if you find someone who's like really complimentary to what you do, you know? Not the same replica as you. So me and Jason had that problem a little bit, because we we're a lot more similar than we were different in some ways, and our initial sales really struggled because neither one of us would really focus on sales kind of an important part of business, you know? Sales. <laughs> but both of us were like always making up excuses to do different things besides sales. Um, so we eventually found a third partner who came in and crushed it because he just was like totally the bulldog on sales. And um, man, if we'd done that five years before and got that fixed, we would have even been bigger. So um, take a personality test. If you like those, they're kind of fun. Like learn what makes you tick and then like get a partner to take one and like learn where you cooperate and where you conflict. Solve those problems. Um, if you're in a partnership and things are going a little wild on you, I would say get a coach or get therapy. Seriously, like, like when you think about in a spouse marriage relationship, you need therapy sometimes. You, a business relationship, is like a marriage. Trust me, you're going to need therapy. <laughs> so, let's see, anything else on this topic? Um, I have a question for you. Yes, go ahead. Um, based on this topic, when do you first um, quit your job? Yeah. Down the company? When it comes to knowing yourself, you thought you knew yourself, and you're at a point where you're saying, I'm going to quit. Uh -huh. um, what were the things that you realized afterwards that, oh, you got nervous about quitting. Right. What were those things about yourself or those characteristics that, or about yourself that was challenging in starting that first business? Yeah, good question. Um, did you guys hear that in the back? Probably not. Probably not. Um, what was challenging about when I quit my job to start my first business? Like, what didn't I know about myself that made it challenging? Um, I alluded to one of them right there that um, I'm good at sales, and when I go in to talk to people, I'm very comfortable with it. And I'm definitely not afraid of it, but my problem with it is I'm not consistent with it. Like, it doesn't get me up in the morning. Like, I just want to make 50 calls today. You know, that doesn't get me up. But if you take me on a visit, well, we're closing them all day long. Um, so actually, one thing I did to like get over that, because there was a little bit of fear there, honestly. I was new at it. I, who isn't afraid of that? <laughs> this is kind of funny. This is like kind of my personality. Um, 
I thought of like, okay, who are the five scariest people that are most intimidating to me? I'm going to lunch with them. So, I, you know, it took some time, but I figured out who they were. These were my demons, so to speak. They had no clue. Nicest people in the world, but I was intimidated. So I called each of them up, figured out a way to get them to lunch, sat, shared food, talked with them, saw they were normal, not scary people. And, you know, I thought I could call anybody. <laughs> I can call them. <laughs> so that was one thing. Um, another, another thing would be uh, I didn't know how distracted I was. I think that's kind of the same thing. Like, uh, and I don't know if it's like, my wife would probably argue that it's worse now than before, the ADD. But seriously, there's like a little, to me that's, I used to think negatively about my ADD, like it was a bad thing. And I was like trying to like, either shame it or control it, judge it, like you shouldn't be there. But now I embrace it. That's kind of my point I made a few minutes ago, of just like, you know what, I do lots of good, I, like, I do lots of things really well. That's just how I roll. That's when I'm happiest. If you try and pin me into one thing, and sometimes you have a partner, I'm not saying Jason was like this, but other people will be like, no, just do one thing, then we're gonna do another thing. You wanna be very linear, very serial about it. I can't do that. Like, I gotta be bumping around, doing a bunch of things, moving all these initiatives at the same time. So just something you learn about yourself. And there's not a great way to speed up that process, I don't think, just be aware be very, when people, here's a, here's a good idea to maybe answer that better. When people are reacting badly towards you because of the way you are, they're giving you good information, right? Like you can take it personally and get all offended and make it a big deal, and it's hard not to. But really, they're telling you about yourself. And because it's a painful thing they're telling you about, you are blind there. So just pay attention. Like when your partners or other people that are just like always bad mouthing or giving you bad, you're reacting, your reaction to them is telling you, they're, they're giving you good information. So, good question. Three minutes, Travis. Three minutes, thank you. Um, last one here then is, well two last ones quick, um, this and versus or decision. You know, um, I've always heard, you can't have it all, you can't, you gotta pick this or that. My, my personal mantra is, this and that. Like, I want to show you a way to have that and the other. The classic example is your cake and eat it too. Classic. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Well, guess what? I do, and I want to, and I can figure a way out to have my cake and eat it too. It's just, it's just I'm going to be obsessed with that. So, call it what you want, but I don't like or decisions. <laughs> I like to stack the good stuff on. That's an and. Um, so another way of thinking about it is a zero-sum game. And by the way, to me, that's more of a toxic personality type. If I recognize someone has kind of like this scarcity mentality, or if I win something, they lose something, I'm out of there. That's toxic, I don't like it, I react badly to that. I'm an and person. Um, always be learning, it's the last one. Um, even in school, I know you're learning a lot, you're reading a ton of books right now, but keep, you, you need to keep learning. Don't ever stop learning. I probably listen to or read three or four books a month. And we're talking, you know, audiobooks. They're this thick. <laughs> How thick is an audiobook? I don't know. But some of them, like, you look at the thing and it says 16 hours left. You're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so, but I listen to a whole bunch of those because. There's so much. Like you're taking a whole other person's cumulative knowledge about life and you're sucking it into your brain in like a week. And I take notes on it. And then I teach it to somebody because I'm always excited about it. And then it cements into me. So here's a couple. These are in the last couple months that I've listened to. Uh, this one, the one exception is this one. I listened to this one years ago, but I'll start at the top. I'll be obsessed or be average. That guy, if you want to pump me up, like, walk up song to your life, it's that book. That guy is like insane positivity. He'll drive you a little bit crazy, but I promise you like it will, like, it's transformative. Like his message it will blow you up. Um, Code of the Extraordinary Mind, this guy, I forgot his name, I already put it on there, you can look it up. He is a brilliant guy that studied all the smartest other entrepreneurs and came up with a system 
that, that he teaches that pro uh, propels them to success. Fascinating, fascinating book. Never split the difference. This one's real practical, tactical about negotiating, but I always hated negotiating. I always was stressed out about it. I read this book and now I'm really liking it. It's really fun. It gives me a pattern to like how to talk to people or negotiate hard deals and do it well. The Elon Musk biography. That guy, if you want to like blow your mind about how to think big, like r listen to that thing. He, you, you just can't even describe how big of a thinker he is. I mean, that sounds like a cliche because we all know what he's up to, but just listen to the book, I try, trust me. Uh, Richard Branson, same thing. Funny, fun, fun story about all the businesses he started and the crazy, crazy risks he took to get there. Very entertaining. Um, Principles by Ray Dalio. Super solid information about how to run your life and how to run a company. Mostly about candor, like how to be so direct with people and so real that it's inescapable like you, that you're communicating accurately with them. And then 12 Rules for Life, Jordan Peterson is one of my favorites. This is more about life skills and like being a healthy, decent person, but it is good, good stuff. So that's one example from a month or two. Um, read lots of stuff, never stop learning, and uh, you'll do great. Thank you. Thank you, Travis.